Good evening. Thank you for joining us for another in our TeleArtworks online lectures. Before we begin, I should like to give you some information about the Atelier at Flowerfield, a 501c3c not-for-profit organization. Our spring four session starts next week. Um, classes are online and open for registration. Uh, we offer a variety of fine art drawing and painting classes in a variety of mediums, both online and in studio. We also offer classes in illustration, digital painting, um, and um, comic book design. We have a variety of paintings on sale in our online art shop, and details can be found on our website, atelierflowerfield.org. Our current exhibition is a two-man show featuring the works of Ross Barbera and Chris Lipinski, and the gallery is open nine to five, Monday through Saturday. Tonight, instructor Ross Barbera, who is also one of the people exhibiting in the atelier, is presenting a demonstration, Introduction to Freehand Airbrush Painting. We welcome him this evening and hope you enjoy tonight's demo. If you wish to ask questions, please post them in the chat room uh, and we will answer them at the end of the lecture. I shall now hand over to Ross Barbera. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ross Barbera, as you already know, and um, I'm gonna present a recorded demonstration on an introduction to airbrush painting. And when the idea about airbrush painting came up and, and doing a webinar devoted to it, I, I was trying to figure out well, what would be the best way to go about doing something like this? Because I, I'm used to walking into a classroom, a college uh, classroom where you have a three hour session and a three hour session. And that gives you a lot of time to cover the basics, introduce students to the materials and some basic techniques of airbrush painting and then they could begin their actual projects. So trying to figure out which way to go, I thought the best thing for me to do was to record the introduction, introduce you to both the materials, the tools, the techniques, and jump right into making a painting. Because I think the most exciting thing about airbrush painting is seeing how a painting evolves, how you begin it, how you build through it, and how you get to the conclusion of the painting. And I hope that's what I can communicate to you in this webinar via the video. That's an example. I just have to pull this into the studio. This is an airbrush painting that I have behind me. It's a um, acrylic on canvas, painted a few years ago, but it's a good example of what can be done with an airbrush. It measures about six feet by four feet. So having said that, I'll uh, step back and let the video begin. Hi everyone. My name is Ross Barbera. I'm a painter. I received my MFA in painting from Pratt Institute in 1975. And my paintings have been exhibited in group and solo exhibitions every year since then. I build my paintings using freehand airbrush painting techniques. And for many years have taught college level courses in airbrush painting. In the following video presentation, I'll demonstrate my method of freehand airbrush painting. The painting that you see behind me is my current work in progress. It's acrylic on canvas and painted exclusively with the airbrush. The very first step in developing a painting is to establish some kind of foundation that you can work into, usually a drawing. For my large canvases, I start right off with acrylic paint and I draw in my subject with an airbrush using acrylic paint. But for the smaller works, I often begin the smaller works on paper, something that could be 22 by 30 or, or smaller, like the demonstration that I'm about to do. I often begin my watercolors with a pencil sketch or a light watercolor sketch. And for today's demonstration, I'll start with a pencil sketch. I mounted a piece of 300 pound Archer's cold pressed watercolor paper onto a drawing board. I taped it down and gessoed lightly over the tape. This way it's not affected by the paint when I start spraying the paint to build the image. I like to keep my drawing as clean as possible, so as I build in corrections, I'll be using my kneaded eraser to get rid of some preliminary lines. I've increased the video speed for the drawing part of the airbrush demonstration.
The only type of eraser I will use on watercolor paper is a kneaded eraser. It's very gentle. It doesn't damage the surface. Anything else is destructive. And what I usually do if I lay in a drawer is I erase most of it. Because these are my preliminary lines. I want to get rid of them. But I use them to correct. When you're drawing, you don't want to get rid of your preliminary lines completely because they are guidelines now. I started out with a blank paper. I didn't know where anything was going. I had to make marks to establish something. Now I could use those marks to evaluate against my subject and continue to make corrections and bring it closer to my subject. Okay, I think I have all I, I need. What I'm going to do is clean it up a little bit more. Really reestablish, get all the gray areas out of there, reestablish the line of the paper, and we'll begin the demonstration. Before I begin to paint, I would like to introduce you to some of the paints and the airbrush and other materials that I'll be using throughout the demonstration. This is an Iwata airbrush. It's an HP TR2, in case you want to look it up. It's trigger action airbrush, and that makes it very comfortable to paint with. And the Iwata airbrush can either be set up for left hand, which it is right now, but I'm right handed, so I need to change it. All you do is pull out that little plug, put it there, and insert the color cup into the right side of the airbrush. Now it's ready to go. And the reason why you would do that is because if you're right-handed like me and you're painting, you don't want to block your field of vision by having a cup on the left side. And the same thing goes for your left hand. If you're left-handed, your field of vision is towards the right, you don't want to block your view with a color cup, so you want it on the left side. The airbrush needs to be attached to a compressor. This is an Iwata airbrush hose that leads to my compressor, and I attached a quick release on the end of the hose so I don't have to unscrew the airbrush to remove it. I just plug it in. It makes switching between airbrushes really easy. See? That's all you do. What's nice about the Iwata airbrush is they designed an air filter that attaches to the bottom of the airbrush itself. Of course, I have an air filter on the outlet of my air compressor, but this is a nice little additional secondary backup filter. There's 20 pounds of pressure in the line right now. What's really nice about the air filter is it provides a comfortable handle to hold on to while you're painting. I have to say, this is the most comfortable airbrush I've ever painted with. And what's the difference between this and a more traditional type of an airbrush? This is my custom Micron, capable of producing extraordinarily fine lines and the trigger mechanism on this one is on top. So you press it down with your index finger. The color cup is at the top. I could work out a canvas with this color cup. It's no, no problem being located there. But I believe it's designed specifically for drafting table work. And this is the type of airbrush I used to have my students get when I, I taught um, airbrush painting. But now with the availability of this, I definitely would recommend this for canvas painting. These are the paints that I use. I stick with Golden Acrylics and I use their High Flow Acrylics and Fluid Acrylics. When I'm painting with an airbrush, I always thin down both the High Flow and the Fluid with 50% Medium. For the High Flow, I use High Flow Medium. For the Fluid, I use Airbrush Medium. Now that might sound confusing. So what happens when you intermix your colors? The high flow can be used for either high flow or fluid acrylics. So when I know that I've mixed paint with high flow, or even if I'm not sure, I just stick with my high flow medium. 
it's a good universal medium for both. And titanium white is a color that I go through huge quantities of titanium white, so I always buy the bigger jar. I premix my colors in advance, and I store the premixed colors in these little jars, these little plastic squeeze bottle jars. And every time I premix a color, I add a tiny steel ball to the, the color so it facilitates homogenizing the color, stirring it up before you use it. Throughout the entire painting process, you'll be needing to clean the delicate tip of your airbrush because paint accumulates on the very fine needle. I don't know if the camera is going to pick this up, but this very fine stainless steel needle that comes out there. And paint, since it's acrylic, will accumulate on that and eventually degrade the quality of your spray. So cleaning is ongoing throughout the entire painting process. And this is what I do. I put cleaning fluid. This is my homemade cleaning fluid. I put it into this Pentel brush. See, so I could squeeze it and dispense a little fluid. And as the paint builds up, I just gently clean the tip. I've taken off the air cap. See the exposed needle. With the eyewater airbrush, you can paint with the air cap off. And what does that do? It allows you to get very close to the surface of your canvas or paper and get a very sharp line. The reason for the air cap is to protect that needle. What if you're painting and you get super close to the surface of the canvas and actually hit the canvas, and I've done that many times? Well, you just damage the needle. It's wise to keep the air cap on. I do remove it to get that tight detail. You'll see me do this in the demonstration. But when I'm doing more general spraying and not getting them really tight, I keep the cap on. We have our paints. We have our airbrush, the air hose, a cleaning device that I rigged, squeeze bottles for dispensing paint, the steel ball, to lay in the drawing on paper. And this is only when I work in watercolor or small pieces on paper for airbrush. I use the technical pen and I draw it in with that. When I paint on canvas, I start directly with my acrylics. I don't use any different kind of medium to lay in a drawing. The cleaning solution that I use is based on a fairly popular recipe that you can find if you Google it. It's one part filtered water, one part 91% isopropyl alcohol, one part windshield washer fluid. Why use this as opposed to buying this? This is extremely expensive, and although I do buy it for heavy cleaning every so often, this is the stuff I use on a daily basis, and I, I'm able to mix it by the gallon, and it's very inexpensive. And since you're using an airbrush and you're spraying paint, make sure you're always wearing an N95 face mask. I'm just about ready to start painting, but I'd like to add that topics like paint mixing, and keeping the airbrush clean, I'll discuss these topics as we progress through the demonstration. First thing I'll do is analyze my subject and see what is the most dominant color. Then I mix that color and I begin to work the color in throughout the entire painting. I carry the color, the mixed color, not only in the object that inspired me to mix that color, but I discover where it could go throughout the surface of the painting and I work it in. I'll start out with a mixture of cobalt blue and quinacridone magenta. I'll use that mixture to create this mauve-like color that I also see hints of it throughout. Put a little in the cup. Now into the cobalt blue, I will add quinacridone magenta. Since I'm going to use an airbrush, I use 50% airbrush medium to dilute the paint. And I like to use the airbrush medium straight. I don't usually add water to the mixture of paint and medium. If I do, a very small amount of distilled water.
you can see how it's close to what's in the photo. After I mix the paint to put it in a jar, I always drop in one of these mixing balls, stainless steel balls in there. Close it down. Stir it up. With the light sketch in place, the first thing I do is I mix the appropriate color and I begin to work it throughout the entire painting. And I think of it as a drawing process. I not only reinforce the sketch, but I start to add in more detail as I see it. So, let's begin. Notice I support the airbrush with two hands. My photo was to my left, the photo that I took of the spring crocus a few weeks ago. I'm painting with a color that's in my brush that's not quite what's in the subject. But I find by building into the image with layers of paint, I can gradually adjust the colors to where I need them to wind up. And by approaching it that way is a gradual evolution of colors that result in something that looks like my subject, I wind up with a rich surface of all kinds of subtle color variations. I'm carefully studying patterns on the pedal surface and suggesting these patterns by modulating value transitions from light to dark. The color is a mixture of cornacridone magenta and cobalt blue. Then I tint it down with titanium white. And I find titanium white is an extremely important color to use in airbrush painting because it adds an opacity to the colors that really helps with building up color areas. I'm a studio painter that relies on my photography to develop my paintings. So I always have my photograph to the left of me, and I'm referring to it constantly. And it's not so much that I'm copying what's there, I feel like I'm paraphrasing what's there, but the photograph provides me with all types of insight into the colors that I want to mix, and I see all kinds of subtleties going on that I gradually work into the painted image. Cleaning my airbrush tip. A little paint built up on that needle. I think we talked about this earlier on. There we go. You can barely see it. But because we're spraying paint, the acrylic, and it's acrylic, it dries on the, the needle eventually. And it's important to get it off. It'll degrade the quality of the the spray if you leave it on and eventually it'll simply stop spraying. So important to have a test piece of paper next to you as you paint. So I think of my paintings as value studies of the surface of the, uh, the image and the subject. And I work in the transitions that I see from light to dark. And of course, why? Because they establish form. I've jumped directly into the painting process without explaining the mechanics of basic airbrush painting. I do plan to get down to the basics and periodically during the demonstration, I'll show you some basic exercises that help develop skill. As you watch me mix my colors, you'll notice that I often refer to the same colors for color mixing. The reason for this is because I use a limited color palette and mix most of my secondary and tertiary colors rather than purchase pre-mixed colors. It's really nice about the airbrush is the way you could introduce gradual transitions from light to dark. 
If you get into airbrush painting, please wear your mask. This is what I have on right now. An N95, and that's that's adequate enough. Also, I'm not doing any heavy spraying. This is very light spraying of paint. And most of my paintings, even my six foot canvases, I approach it the same way. So minimal amounts of particulates are floating around, but you need to wear the mask. Notice that as I spray, I'm modulating the color from dark to light and fade out. I first start applying the paint with the airbrush relatively close to the surface of the paper. Then I pull the airbrush back as I fade out. I'm also gradually releasing pressure on the trigger, allowing the trigger to move forward. I'll show you how the trigger action directly affects the needle a little later on in the video. When you pull back on the trigger, the needle is retracted from the air blast nozzle that is located at the tip of the airbrush. This increases the opening where the paint exits from the airbrush and therefore increases the volume of paint coming out of the airbrush. It doesn't matter whether I'm working on a tiny piece or a six foot canvas. I mix that singular color, the most common denominator color I see, and I work it throughout the surface, just like you see me doing. The closer I bring my airbrush to the surface, the stronger the, the color, the sharper the line, and the further I pull it away from the surface. See that? the more subtle and fainter the line. That's the beauty of the airbrush painting. If you want a nice sharp line, bring your airbrush in tight. Hold it as perpendicular to the surface as possible. And if you want to fade that line out, it just back up. I'm beginning to suggest the patterns of light and dark based on the shadows that I see in the photograph. This shadow area over here will provide nice contrast for the lighter part of the petal in front of it. background is totally out of focus. So you see what I'm doing with my hand, holding the airbrush far away from the surface. And I'm just working in hints of what will eventually turn into the background. Okay, there's a darker area here. My initial approach to establishing a painting is always monochromatic. And after I have the structure established, I'll analyze the photo and mix the next most dominant color that I see and work into the surface with that color. Now, of course, if this was a four foot canvas or a three foot canvas, what you're seeing me do here would take the entire day. Now that I have much of the drawing in place, and indicated some of the background, what I'd like to do is attack the central yellow part of the flower and just bring it out so I have some contrast from where it is against the petals. And I'll also add the green at this point. And what I decided to do with the center part, instead of going to the lightest yellow that I see in the photo, here, let's get the photo over here. I'm gonna use my premixed 
orangish color as a base color to start out with and then I'll be able to very effectively work in the lighter yellows on top of that. It'll provide a good foundation for working in. Also I can see how in areas like this I can begin to apply the color and work in some of the hints of the out of focus background using this orangey color. So let's put some of this color into the airbrush cup. Make sure the color cup cap is on. Now with the orange color, I'm gonna to begin to draw in the central part of the crocus. So it provides nice contrast against the mauve color of the crocus. And I'll be able to work in lighter yellows to give it definition and bring it closer to what I see in the photo. I created this orange color by mixing Hasna yellow medium with Nepothal red and titanium white. With the airbrush paint in, I don't like to get paint on so heavy that it starts getting pushed around with the air. I put enough on the cover and then I move away from that area. I don't want it to build up to a point where it becomes a wet paint and has the potential of being pushed all over the place in like spider formations. If I linger too long in an area, see what happens? Now let's take a little of this orangey color and begin to use it in the background because I do see it. Nice, beautiful, warm color. And what you will see, it's not happening yet, but what you'll eventually see with airbrush painting that as you apply layer upon layer and mist it on, the colors begin to interact and optically mix to create all kinds of secondary and tertiary colors. And I don't worry about the overspray. My approach to airbrush painting is a freehand approach. What does freehand mean? It's all freehand. I'm working with my hand, I'm holding the airbrush, and I'm painting as if I have a regular paintbrush in my hand. Freehand means I don't use masking material or frisket to establish my, my shapes and my edge lines. I don't need to control where the paint is going by blocking off areas that I don't want to use that color on. I actually rely on the overspray to create interesting, subtle nuances of tone that contribute to the overall painting when it's finished. And I can develop sharp edges by working the background, then moving to the foreground, and so on and so on. And by concentrating on bringing my brush close to the surface of the painting, canvas or the paper, whatever, I can achieve a much sharper focused line or edge. Eventually, I'd, I don't want viewers to be aware of lines. I want them to simply be aware of the boundaries between shapes, the edges between shapes, where one color area butts up against another color area. Having prepared a little bit of green, I'm going to begin to paint in the leaves of the flower down here. Hold the airbrush close to the paper. 
fine line. Pull it back, a heavier and heavier line. I'm also pulling back on the trigger and that's increasing the volume of paint. I'm going to lightly work into the pedal in the background. I'm not worrying about the overspray because all of that will disappear when I paint this pedal in. I like the background lid to be very soft focus. Out of focus, basically. Okay. The green I have in my airbrush is a lot more yellow in it. And I'll push it more to the blue end as I develop the image. I like this leaf here. I think it, it, it's important for the gravity of the composition to get it in. My paintbrush seems like it has a dry tip. This is the gentlest way of cleaning the airbrush needle. The cleaning fluid that I use is homemade. It's a, it's a mixture of one-third isopropyl alcohol, one-third windshield wiper fluid, and one-third distilled water and a few drops of dishwashing soap. And it's very good cleaner. It really, it does the job nicely. I mix up a gallon at a time. It costs only a few bucks. And it's important to keep this part of the airbrush really clean because it'll interfere with the quality of spray. You want to be very gentle with cleaning your airbrush, especially this area, because these parts are expensive. Okay, where were we? We were drawing in the bottom leaf of the crocus. When I need to paint in detail, I bring the airbrush very close to the surface of my canvas or paper. Bringing the airbrush within a few millimeters of the surface results in sharper and more visible brush strokes and more concentrated applications of paint. As I move my airbrush further from the surface, I can fade out my brush strokes and at the same time create softer edges and subtle out of focus effects. I began this demonstration by jumping right in and beginning a painting. I think at this point in the painting's development, it would be good to stop and roll back a bit and show you some basic exercises, the kind of stuff that I would normally introduce to students on the first day of class. A very basic thing to practice is simply creating a flat wash with an airbrush. So we'll mask off an area. The sound that you're hearing is my vent system. Above where I'm painting, I have two exhaust vents that suck the air out of the studio. So whenever I do any spraying, I make sure the studio is well vented and I also wear my face mask. To develop the flat wash, I keep my airbrush about an inch away from the paper surface and I depress and pull back on the control lever of the airbrush to regulate the paint flow. The control lever is the button directly behind the color cup on the custom micron that I am using to lay in this flat wash. Hand movement needs to be steady and smooth with constant even pressure on the airbrush's control lever. When you need to stop applying paint, gradually move the control lever forward and keep the lever depressed until the paint stops flowing. It's very important that you don't abruptly stop the paint flow by quickly removing your finger from the control lever on the airbrush. The airstream needs to be maintained until the paint completely stops flowing. Otherwise, there will be excessive paint buildup on the needle tip 
the airbrush. And eventually the paint will begin to spatter or the airbrush will simply stop working. You just watched me apply a golden color flat wash. Next, I'll work in a graded wash that will transition from a more saturated color at the top and gradually fade out at the bottom. With mixed magenta in my airbrush, I hold my airbrush relatively close to the paper surface and start applying the paint. And I gradually pull back from the surface to fade it out. Why don't I get a blue and see what happens if I introduce blue to the top of that? I can't resist getting a piece of paper, ripping it, and putting it here and using it as a stencil to see what happens. You just watched me lay in a flat wash, the golden color in the background. Then on top of that, I applied two graded washes. First was a magenta that I carried down, darker at the top, faded it out back to the golden color on the bottom. Then on top of that, I added a dark blue and faded that out. Then I had a little bit of fun and I used a stencil, torn paper to create these little hill-like shapes. And this is how I would often begin my first day of class. Just get the students to play with the airbrush in a controlled sort of way and have some fun with it. So they begin to become familiar with the tool. And the little, in the little demonstration that I did on how to apply a flat and graded wash, I was referring to the control lever on the Custom Micron. This is the control lever. And as you pull that lever back, the volume of paint coming out of the airbrush increases and you get a heavier, heavier spray. I'm removing the air cap and there you see the needle. Now I'm going to pull the control lever back. Excuse the paint all over my hands. Can you see that? The needle is forward. If I press down, I'd be getting no spray at all. If I pull back, the spray starts to come out and it gets heavier and heavier the further I pull it back. And the Micron is designed for use at a drafting table. That's why you see the color comp on top at that angle, because if you're painting perpendicular to the drafting table, the position of the color cup is perfect. This is the airbrush that I've been using throughout the demo that you've been watching. It's my Iwata Revolution, a number two. The number two refers to the size of the nozzle, the needle, and the air blast jet that's inside of this assembly. It comes in either size one or two. This is the color cup that comes with the airbrush. And I filled it with water right now. To control the volume of paint coming out of it, it's trigger action. When you first pull the trigger back, although you hear the air, no paint would be coming out at this point. So with the air cap removed, you have a good view of that needle. Now, as I pull that trigger back, nothing is happening. At this point, it's traveling back and you can hear the air but no paint would be coming out at this point. When it makes contact with the needle mechanism, suddenly you can feel a little resistance. And that's when continued pressure on the trigger will result in paint coming out. See, you can see it. Now this is just water. And the more pressure I apply to the trigger, the greater the volume of paint that would be coming out. And then as I release the pressure on the trigger and move it forward, 
it stops. If you're painting, pulling the trigger back, laying in color, and then you abruptly stop like that, you'll get little bits of paint built up on the needle tip that will either spatter onto your work or dry and clog the airbrush. So the airbrush is designed to allow air to continue to flow even though the paint flow has stopped. And the reason why is it will blow off any residue paint that has accumulated on that needle. Aside from showing students and having students practice a flat wash and a graded wash, another first day exercise would be to have students practice creating a straight line I'm hardly applying any pressure to the trigger. So now to get a graded tone, I've pulled back from the surface of the paper. Practice in painting straight or curvilinear lines are excellent exercises. Building simple biomorphic forms is another good introductory exercise that helps develop basic airbrush skills. When a student first picks up an airbrush to use for painting, it's good to have them freely play around with the airbrush to create simple abstract patterns and shapes. This enables the student to become familiar with the mechanics and actions of an airbrush without the burden of trying to create representational imagery. But after spending a little time with some basic exercises that familiarize the student with working with an airbrush, it's important to get into representational imagery as soon as possible, because that's where the student really learns how to paint with an airbrush. Even practice in writing your name is excellent airbrush practice. Although there are many more elementary exercises that I can introduce you to, I think we should get back to painting the crocus flower. I've increased the video playback speed for much of the painting that you see me doing in this demonstration, primarily because painting with an airbrush is a slow process and if you were watching me paint at normal speed, it would be difficult to see any development in the painted image. I've worked in the mauve-like color, a little bit of orangey yellow, and a green. For my next color, I think a good choice would be this mixture of primary magenta and titanium white. I see it poking through in these areas, and it's a nice opaque color, so it's going to allow me to effectively establish some of these details because it's going to have very strong covering capabilities due to the titanium white. And I'm going to carry that color throughout wherever I think it could be applied. By continuously working back and forth from the background to the foreground, the edges, the boundaries between forms emerge nicely and take on a very natural, integrated look. If I see they're getting a little too fuzzy, I just work into the foreground objects and the fuzziness gradually disappears. See how I move the airbrush? I move the airbrush in the direction that I see the detail moving on the pedal. To clean my airbrush, I bring it over to my studio sink. So I unplug the color cup. This hose leads directly into the drain pipe, 
but it's beyond the P-trap. So the P-trap seals off any vapors that might back up into my studio. And what I can do with this is I plug my airbrush into this. I take one of these squeeze bottles that I filled up with my homemade cleaning fluid. And it has one of these needles. I buy these from a jewelry supply company. And I stick it in there. You know, I just flood it with cleaning fluid. Then, knowing that the chamber part has been thoroughly cleaned, I plug in the color cup. I fill that up with fluid and flush it through. Now everything is just going down the drain and backup vapors are being prevented from coming into the studio by the P-trap. And I usually do this twice. That gives me a really good color clean. Aside from what I just showed you, there are also very effective and inexpensive airbrush cleaning pots that can be purchased at your local art store or online. I've thoroughly cleaned out my airbrush because I want to switch to pure titanium white and work in some of the highlights that I see here and the uh, white stripe in the leaves. Squeeze some paint into the color cup. I'd like to start with this section right over here. The leaves have white highlights down their centers, so I'll work these areas in first, then I'll apply the white throughout the rest of the painting at varying degrees of spray density. Bringing the airbrush close to the surface results in heavier paint applications and stronger, more visible brush strokes. When I move it away from the surface, this allows me to fade out the brush strokes and create subtle hints of colors. Throughout developing any of my paintings, I use white extensively, just the way you're seeing me do it now. I'll work in some basic colors, and I often switch back to white because of the way I could control the fineness of the spray. It's a way of adjusting colors to create tints. The edge of the petal has a white highlight. Up to now, you've been watching me paint with the air cap on, and I keep it on when I'm painting most of the time because I don't want to damage the needle, but I would like to show you how you can paint without it. The advantage of taking off the, the air cap is it allows you to get an even sharper line than you can with the air cap on. I'm using the mixture of diazazine purple and quinacridone violet to establish some of the sharper detail that I see. And that's why I took off the color cap because this is a tiny little piece that I'm working on. And I want to be able to get in really tight with the airbrush to achieve that type of sharp line. But it still has a soft quality to it. That's what I love about the airbrush. I don't worry about the overspray because eventually I'll go back into the foreground and paint on top of the overspray. So it's a back and forth process. 
I'm looking at my photo, it's to my left, I'm studying the patterns of light and dark, and I'm paraphrasing what I'm seeing. I'm not trying to copy the detail exactly as it is in the photo, but I'm using it as a guide. although I'm mixing colors that approximate what I'm seeing. But my concern is more focused on establishing the patterns of light and dark. And there's a dark area up here that I think compositionally is very important. This is taking on a very uh, violetish quality, and I want to start shifting it to other colors. So for my next color, I mix a little bit of ultramarine and cerulean blue and mostly titanium white, and I'll begin to work in some of the blues that I see in the photo, especially in this area right over here. That sound that you hear occasionally going on in the background happens to be my compressor. Okay, I want to carry some of that blue into this area right over here. Ultramarine seems to tone other colors down, graze them down a bit. For the background, I keep my hand relatively far away from the surface of the paper. I'm painting on Archer's cold pressed 300 pound paper. It depends what I'm doing on the primary subject, but most of the time I'm bringing my hand in relatively close because I want to get a more concentrated mark. As I'm spraying, I'm not only adjusting the proximity of the airbrush to the surface, I'm also pulling back to on a trigger to varying degrees to control the amount of paint flow. See, if I pull the trigger back, really pull it back, the paint's gonna come gushing out. But if I gently pull it just a little bit and I can control the line anywhere between a gush And a fine line. I'm using this mixed blue for the darker areas. I'm starting to get a little bit of contrast between the background and the crocus. Now I hardly have any paint left in there, but what I think I'm going to do is use a little bit of that residual paint, add a few drops of white, put my finger on the, the tip of the airbrush bubble it up and mix it because I, I do need a little bit of a light blue and um, maybe that'll give me what I need and that, that's another way I mix my colors often I don't clean out the brush and put an entirely new color in 
I'll adjust my colors directly in the color cup that's on the airbrush without cleaning out the brush. I even like the transition that I get as the color shifts over from the original color in the cup to the new color. This is still a little of that color, the old color, in the channel of the airbrush itself. I'm not going to immediately get the color that I just mixed by adding the white. But since this is such a small color cup, it'll happen relatively soon. Yeah, it's a lighter tint. Very pale blue in certain areas of this crocus. For my next color, I'm going to return to a little bit of this pre-mixed green, which is a combination of cerulean blue and Hansa yellow light and titanium white to tint it down. And why am I doing that? I'm doing that because I'd like to reinforce the detail here, get a little stronger accent of green there, and start to carry the green more strongly into the background. Now I'm switching over to a little burnt sienna that's been mixed down with titanium white. And I'm doing that because I'm seeing lots of brown throughout the background. And notice how I work in colors, singular colors, throughout the entire surface of the painting. It would be good to tint this burnt sienna with quite a bit of white. So I can work in some of these areas over here. I like these areas. Good. Looks like a much lighter value, and I would like that in areas like over here. Often I work the... Uh, objects around my primary subject to such a degree that I begin to lose the edges of my primary subject, that's when it's time to jump back into the main theme of the painting. Lots of soft focus little glows of color in this area. It'll be fun to develop them. It's also very interesting to watch the way the paint settles in these plastic containers. The paint will settle in layers, and the white is often on the very bottom. Here's what I'm talking about. Here's a jar containing um, quinacridone gold and titanium white. I use the quinacridone gold quite often as a substitute for burnt sienna. And look how the white has settled to the bottom. Plus, I put a steel ball in here. You hear it? So when I shake it up, that little heavy steel ball facilitates the mixing of the pigment. I'm applying a pre-mixed mauve color to begin to suggest details on the surface of the petals. Are you getting the idea of how gradual and subtle an airbrush painting process can be.
working with the trigger mechanism on the airbrush. The more you paint, the easier it becomes. Eventually it becomes reflexive. I'm attempting to articulate with the airbrush a very faint line. And what that requires me to do is apply minimal pressure to the trigger. You don't want the paint gushing out. You want it almost imperceptibly fine. Look at that. For my next color, I want to start to bring out these rich violet colors on the flower. So I'm going to start with my magenta. And I'm going to add a little cobalt blue to that color. I'm using the fluid acrylics. And although these are wonderfully thinned down for the kind of painting I like to do with the brush, they're way too thick for the airbrush. So, grab some of my airbrush medium and add it to the paint. The medium is loaded with retarders, paint retarders, that help prevent the buildup of dry paint on the needle tip. And I always use a 50-50 mixture. There are no exact rules to thinning down your paint for airbrushing, aside from the recommended 50-50 percentage, and that's recommended by the manufacturer of this particular paint. After you do that, you may be finding a need to thin it down even more. And you can add a little water or high flow medium. I like to stick with the high flow medium, and if I add water, I always add distilled water. See, I'm pulling back my trigger now, and nothing is coming out. There we go. Come out. The reason why I don't paint was coming out is I'm probably getting a buildup on the uh, needle. So what do I do? I clean it. Beautiful. If I get to the end of an area that I'm painting and I want to stop, I simply release the pressure on the trigger. I'll do that again. I want to stop right there. I'll release the pressure on the trigger, but I still allow the air to come out because what that does is it helps clean the tip of the needle by blowing off any paint that might be on it. If I stopped abruptly, I would get a quicker buildup of paint. And that is definitely something you want to avoid. Although I usually keep the, uh, the air pressure around 20 pounds per square inch, there are no set rules as to the exact air pressure you should use. The particular color that you're using the thickness of the thin down paint all affect the pressure that you're going to be needing to use. And you have to play around with the pressure to hit it on the head. But usually 20 pounds is a good ballpark figure. It works nicely with most paints. Now I'm using this violet that I mixed over the blues 
in some of the greens of the background to darken the background. Now that I have a little bit of paint left in the cup, I'd like to tint it down even further. So I'm going to add a little titanium. Put my finger on the air cap, bubble it up. That forces any of the previous color that's in the channel here back into the cup and mixes it up. The reason why I tinted down the color with some titanium white, I wanted the color with more opacity to it to be able to cover some of the color underneath. Often I mix directly in the color cup. And I'll continue to adjust the color, turn it into other colors without cleaning out the airbrush. And I just added more white to that little color cup. I want to continue to tint this down to progressively lighter and lighter values. Still have a lot of work to do here, but I see raw sienna-ish colors in this area, and I'm thinking if I put a dot of yellow in there, I can bring this closer to this and use it in the background. And I do intermix. I'm going to go with a little bit of my high flow. You can mix high flow with fluid acrylics. Let's see what that's going to give us. Yeah, that's, that's a nice color. Often I don't use burnt sienna or raw sienna. I mix my primaries. The color that I mixed here was a red, was a blue, then thinned down a little bit with in here with titanium white. On top of that, I just added a yellow. I'm mixing my primaries directly in here to get secondary and tertiary colors. Now this color that I just mixed by adding yellow resulted in a color that is close to raw sienna. Tint it down further. I may not have enough room in this color cup to do what I want to do. I want to continue to push this color to lighter and lighter values and add more yellow to it. To darken the areas over here, and maybe bring a little up to here, here, I'm gonna go with anthraquinone blue. Here I have it pre-mixed with a 50, 50 percentage mixture of airbrush medium and paint, paint directly out of the jar. I haven't added any titanium white. With anthraquinone blue in the airbrush, I'm gonna to start to work in some of the darker values I see down here. Notice I'm not worrying about the petals. I'll just paint them in again. But in order to maintain the continuity of the background, 
I don't hesitate spray over the foreground if I have to. It all contributes to the rich variety of colors in the final piece. What I would like to do next with this anthroquinone blue is tint it down even further so I can start working in these lighter values that I see. I can't possibly do that in this little color cup. So I'm going to pour some of the paint out. In fact, I'll pour it all out. Save it for future use. Add the white. It's given me a hint of blue right now as it comes out of the sailbush, and I need that in this area. I'm going to tint it out further. Now that the image is solidly laid in, I'm going to continue to paint into it and develop it to what I consider to be a finished state. For my next color, I'm going to use this mixture of permanent green light and titanium white to begin to establish some of the greens I see in these areas and start to redevelop this down here. Eventually, I'll adjust the color of the crocus more towards the blue end of the spectrum because I see a lot of blue in areas like this and in the petals. And I'll also bring this out with much lighter yellows. I started out with a light green, but then I switched to a darker mixture of ultramarine blue with Hasna yellow medium and added a touch of titanium white. Now I'm applying a tinted version of that color. Same color, only lots of white. I'm applying light sprays of this tinted green in the background to adjust soft focus pale green areas. Now I'm going to return to pure white, pure titanium white, to continue working into these sections of the petals. And probably I'll carry the white into areas over here and in the background, wherever it's needed. White is the dominant color of the center parts of the leaves. And there were also white highlights in the background. Now I'm 
Now I'm reinforcing the whites that I see along the edges of the petals. I just took off the air cap to enable me to get in tighter in areas like this and this. The Iwata is a precision tool that has the capability of producing extremely fine lines and very subtle mists. If your intention is to paint in a photorealistic style, this is definitely the airbrush to use. Can you see the buildup? Look at that. That's why it's imperative to clean it because that buildup will degrade the quality of the spray and eventually the brush will not spray at all. I'm working in a very light yellow to develop this part of the flower. My studio work is based exclusively on my photography. My camera is my image hunting tool and I'm always out there photographing landscape and flowers and whatever as research for paintings. But when I do work outside, that work is dedicated totally to objective drawing and painting from the landscape. No camera work involved. I feel it's vitally important for studio artists to take an opportunities to draw directly and work directly from nature. For that work, I usually use watercolor, my sketch pad, or I really like working on the tablet. Uh, programs like Procreate and Photoshop are ones I often use to draw directly in the tablet. Tablets are wonderful for working outside. Now I'm going to throw a little bit more green into this yellow. Blowing out the yellow. Good. Now I have the green. Just for fun, I'm going to throw a little orange into that green mixture and see what happens. This could be an effective color for areas over here and over here. The addition of the orange to the pre-mixed green is resulting in a beautiful brownish warm color that I see weaving itself throughout this area. So with just using primary colors, I've mixed a color that comes extremely close to yellow oxide or raw sienna. And sometimes I limit my palette to a simple selection of primary colors, usually phthalo cyanine blue, primary magenta or uh, quinacridone magenta, hasna yellow medium, and titanium white. And sticking with those three colors, I can mix an incredible spectrum of colors just by using this process of mixing in the cup. Now I'm going to dig into my collection of pre-mixed colors and start to work on some of the detail. I just switched out my color for a much lighter value of the color that you just saw me apply. Now I'm applying a very 
dilute mixture of diazine purple and lots of high flow media there happens to be a lot of purple in this part of the flower in this color i left it very transparent no white it's perfect to bring out the purplish areas as i develop my paintings i work back and forth between colors that are tinted with titanium white and colors that remain 100 percent transparent transparent glazes over opaque underpainting enriches the painting and this flower does have a lot of purple in it. See how I can get into the shadow area and accentuate that with this color? Often I'll develop areas with just white with the intention of glazing into them with transparent colors because the white acts as a reflective underpainting that intensifies the transparent color on top of it. Sort of like watercolor painting. When you lay down a wash over the white of the paper, it's the light passing through the wash, hitting the white of the paper and bouncing back to your retina that produces those beautiful, rich, luminous watercolor washes that we're all accustomed to seeing. So even though I've been talking about how I mix down most of my colors with titanium white, in reality, I do work with a combination of opaques and transparents. And by the time I'm into the final stages of the painting, I'm working back and forth between the two and often glaze over my opaque colors with transparent colors. Now, I'm working in with golden acrylics, primary magenta, mixed with titanium white. To bring out some of the lighter values. At this stage of the painting's development, I need to continue to build into it. Work in the background, work in the foreground, add in detail, making changes and adjustment until everything, in my opinion, seems to work. I happen to have a little burnt sienna in my airbrush, so let's use that to bring out some of the browns. I can apply light oversprays to adjust the colors underneath. So when I come to an area like this, which is fairly dark in the photo, I could shift it to a hint of golden brown, but I, I'm also able to darken the area because I'm overlaying it on top of a blue and they somehow optically intermix to create darker values. As I move into the final stage of this demonstration, I've been mixing colors and building into the image off camera, the same as you've watched me do all throughout this presentation. When I'm almost finished a painting, I usually spend some time reestablishing the highlights. One area that I've totally neglected is the center bright yellow part of the flower. So before I end the demo, I'll do a little work in this area. I do realize that airbrush painting can be extraordinarily subtle. The paint that goes on often is very light mists and the camera may not be picking it up. It's important to understand that these extremely light applications of paint enable me to adjust the colors throughout in very subtle ways. That concludes this introductory presentation to freehand airbrush painting. Thanks for watching. That was great, Ross. Um, does anyone have any questions? From Nancy Wentworth to the host, how expensive is the equipment?
the um, it, well, it depends on what kind of airbrush that you purchase. The eye water that I was using, the one I have it right here, actually. This airbrush is not necessarily needed for uh, for airbrush painted in a, in a course. You can buy a less expensive airbrush. This airbrush runs about $300. I think at Dick Lick, they sell them for around $249. This is the uh, TR2 trigger action airbrush. The Micron that I show you is very expensive. And I, I rarely use that in class. I would, I would use it for myself, but I would have students buy a Pache airbrush, which was many hundreds of dollars cheaper. The Micron goes for $600, $700. No, uh -huh. yeah, airbrush painting, but there, there are, there are much less expensive alternatives. These, this is a beautiful tool to paint with, the action, uh, the comfort in the hand. It's much more comfortable than a trigger. I find when I work with the, the, the lever, I get a little pain for some reason in this area of my hand. But this, I, I could paint all day long, and not feel any discomfort in my hand. You, that, and how much is the compressor? <laughs> yes, yes. There are all different kinds of options with compressors. A lot of art stores sell these little tiny compressors that I, I don't happen to like. I think they're overpriced and they're not as effective as, as the type I have here. What I have here is a small round compressor. Um, offhand, I can't think of the brand that it is, but I bought it at Home Depot and it probably ran me about $200. The questions that you, the um, airbrush you use that you recommend to students, which is that one? Oh, I wonder if I have one here. A uh, Pache. Pache was the uh, the first airbrush I ever I ever picked up and, and used as a, as a student. It's um, usually it's I, I think uh, the uh, Dick Look has a Pache Millennium airbrush that's about one hundred and forty nine dollars. It's a wonderful airbrush. Would it, you recommend yeah. that for a beginner then? The airbrush that I would recommend in a class is the Pache Millennium Airbrush, Millennia Airbrush, and it probably runs about $140. Now, I've paid that much for good watercolor brushes. So, you know, it's comparable. And it's uh, with, with that airbrush, I could easily paint a six foot canvas like this. <laughs> Okay, I think I think your demonstration pretty much said it all. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like it. Um, so yeah. I'd like to thank you very much for giving us such a, a fascinating uh, demonstration. It's amazing to watch well, the colors build up. Um, and we hope the audience found it also uh, engaging and interesting. Um, I hope so. I, I uh, want to thank you for the opportunity to have uh, to enable me to do this. It was a lot of fun. And um, I think I'm gonna continue with a small series of works on paper because I haven't done any small work in a long time and it was fun doing it. I spent a few more hours painting after I finished the video, after the recording for the video. The recording all total was about three hours, three and a half, four hours of recording that I distilled down to what you saw. And I uh, this week spent a couple more hours on this. So this is about a five hour painting. And I think it's going to become part of an ongoing small works on paper series because it was fun. I enjoyed it. That's good to know. Um, right. So our next lecture will be a, a demonstration by um, our instructor, James Beale, on Thursday, June 16th. He'll be discussing and demonstrating the art of Dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons. And I believe he'll actually be doing an oil painting. So please look out for our email about this lecture and other upcoming events and classes. And again, Ross, we thank you. And to everyone else, good night. Thank you, Gabby. Good night, everyone.